Hello, everybody. Very nice to be here on, I on Iceland again, really. Um, I was very, very happy to be invited, really. I must say that. But, but due to the political situation, I'm not going to talk so much about piracy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm, we are following very closely what's happening here on Iceland. Many, many in the Norwegian politics and the Norwegian parliament are really friends of Iceland. And um, during my uh, six years as Minister of Justice in Norway, uh, we had a very close cooperation with you. I'm uh, looking back to that with um, uh, very much gratefulness. Uh, and I had the pleasure to meet Ragna to yesterday, eating dinner. And over two countries are facing very much of the same challenges, really. Maybe in different scales, uh, but uh, I think we can do so much together. And we don't do uh, find up things, both we can do it together. And this is really a part of politics where we can do something together. We can do it together because uh, many of the people committing crime today, they are traveling cross-border. Then we have to do it together in an international aspect, of course. Uh, to harmonize, to harmonize how we are looking into it. But of course, this is, of my opinion, one of the most difficult political areas to work on. We have to be very clever in how we are arguing about this issue to convince the voters. And I don't really think this is <laughs> a, a, a topic in politics which is easy to solve by referendums. Uh, then we have to do a very good job to explain how things work. So, um, when being a minister from 2005 to 2011, through the very, very difficult days in Oslo, Utøya, in the summer days of 2011, I left the government in the autumn of the six years as Minister of Justice, this, uh, one of the most long-sitting uh, ministers in that ministry. Uh, I think this was the most important issue. But the autumn 2011, it wasn't easy for us to bring such thoughts to the political agendas in, in Norway. But I'm very proud. I'm very proud of my prime minister. I'm very proud of my ministry. Because we did it. We didn't accept the ultimate uh, sentencing for the man who uh, committed so serious crime in Oslo and uh, at Utøya. We had ice in our stomach, but uh, warmth in our hearts. Uh, I think uh, we learn a lesson, of course. Today in Norway, it's not so often raised question about death penalty or people must sit all their lives in prison. And I think that's one one reason for that is that people are asking the same question as I did when I became a minister. I was working as a lawyer before that, defense lawyer. So I knew, I knew what's, what's going on and what's what not going on inside the prison. I asked the question and many people do it today. Maybe you can take some chairs there if you want to sit. This is a very good speech for how to sit down. <laughs> um, <coughs> Very good. Anyway, <laughs> next. <laughs> okay. We asked the question, why is it like this? On the field or in, in, in prisons regarding to criminals, we are a society expecting so much change. More change in their lives than me or you or Arnie or 
others are faced ever. Maybe you have to change, Arne, <laughs> but not so much as a criminal. Why is it like that, that, that when we are expecting so much change, change the politicians and the justice ministers and all his helpers, why is it like this that they don't change? They don't change. And if you come to a prison today in Sudlande, is it? And in Reykjavik, or in Halden, or Ullersmo in Oslo, or Kumla in Sweden, or Rikers Island in New York, why is it like that? These instruments, this type of politics, this type of meeting people, when they really need change, this type of instrument haven't changed at all since the beginning of 18th century. If you come into a Norwegian prison today, it's the same facilities meeting these people as people met in the 18th, 1800th century. The same room, the same way to treat it, the same way to lock the door, maybe a little bit modern locking system, but that is the same way of thinking. And I, didn't, I don't think as a politician that's fair when we see how much the society has changed. Technology, how we have changed behavior against each other, how we have changed the, the working system, how we have changed the whole welfare system, how the medicine, the healthcare system have changed. Why hasn't this system changed? Why must this be like this, that we are going to use this old, very old recipe, meeting people who have committed crime, of course, they have and has, and they will do. But I think we should expect from politicians dealing with this question that they have also need, that we expect that they need to change. And that was the basis for when we started the work in the ministry in 2005. And I told the staff, it's a fantastic ministry, really. Yeah. I love it. I miss it every day. I don't miss the position, but I miss the people there, really. They were very eager to do it, and I know it's people here in the audience who have been cooperating a lot with them. And we had a perfect base to start this uh, discussion, how to do it. And for me, as a social de democratic politician, it is a core value for me, how we are meeting and facing this challenging aspect of politics. And I also say to the right-wing party in Norway, that if you really want to reduce the crime, then you have to do like this. You have to reduce the recidivists and the number of them if you want to reduce the crime. You have to leave the old methods and you have to think new regarding to this. So it's strange for me that right-wing party, parties are very often winning the debate about how to fight crimes, but they are using the old recipe that all of us know for many reasons are not working. I, fi I find it very strange. And that was the reason why we started to work on this. And I, I think it's gave, it has given us good results. And since then we have a, a shift in the government in 2013 in Norway. So we got a right wing government Absolutely right-wing, more right-wing than ever in Norway. That's true. But they, they haven't, and I honor them for that. They haven't changed this, what we pick implemented. I'm very glad to say that. They were opposing it in the parliament, definitely. I was not a popular minister among these politicians. But they didn't change it when they come into position. And uh, I think that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing for us politicians. We know that once, uh, one day we are going to leave our position. We don't own it. Lucky me. Uh, but uh, it's difficult to, to take away such much, uh, politics like this. When they have started it, it's a good circle. So we started the work very early, and I told the uh, ministry that this is 
one of the main topics when I'm the minister here. This is my favorite. I'm very eager to speak about it. It's, I find it, find it difficult to speak in English, really, because I, I have done it so much in Norwegian. So I think I'm much better in Norwegian, but I do my best in English, and I hope you understand. And if it's some, something you don't understand, please ask. Yeah. <coughs> and I also written a book about it. It's outside the door. You can buy it, but if you don't buy it, you can steal it. And, and then the money from the book sale is going to a, a victim organization back in Norway. So it's 1,500 Icelandic kroner, I think. Is that cheap? No, it's cheap, okay. But you can steal it if you want. <laughs> I don't want to take it back to Norway. <laughs> I am any more of them there. Let's uh, take a look uh, at the Norwegian crime situation then, when we started. As, as uh, Iceland, uh, Norway is a very peaceful country. And I told my colleagues abroad, uh, when they asked, why is it so uh, less crime, uh, why is it so little amount of crime in, in Norway? I told them, it's not caused by the prisons. It's caused by the welfare system. That we have um, shared the natu natural resources in Norway in a good manner that we have pr prioritized to keep up a decentralized uh, living, that people can live outside the big cities. We don't have this press, press to the cities. Uh, and we saw the last 25 years, a stable situation. We had some more theft from profit crime. We had uh, uh, some more drug uh, related uh, crime. Uh, and a little bit more violence, but not much. If you see um, uh, those people who are sentenced into, uh, and, and put into prison in 2007, 21% uh, was for drunk driving, 43% for theft and profit crime, drugs 13%, violence 20%, and if we saw to the very, very serious types of crime, murder of crime, um, homicide, for example, uh, we had a very good rate. Uh, so the last year, I, I checked it out uh, yesterday, in 2015, as you can see down there, we had 23 uh, people being murdered in Norway. That's a low number, but it's 23 too much, of course. But that's uh, from 1986, that it's uh, dec declined and reduced with uh, almost 50%. And if, if I ask my old aunt, how is the crime situation developing in Norway? She means, and she's 90 years old, she means that things is going much worse now than it did when she was young. And in, indeed, it was going worse when I was minister, she meant. So she was not aware of this. And I think you are facing very much of the same challenge in, here in Iceland, how people are looking into it. I have seen some report, I will, I will come back to that. Uh, and if, if we take a look into, into prisons in Norway, we saw one main challenge for us working with uh, this area uh, and that was the average length they were imprisonment was very low. People thought that the people sit the prisoners sitting in prison they were sitting there for years but they went. So the average length in 1999 was 155 days and it was stable. In 2006, when I came in the ministry, it was 160 days. Uh, and it's a little difficult to understand what will happen while they uh, are sitting there for 160 days. On average, not much. Very much in their lives were destroyed. They lost their jobs. They didn't have any contact with their families or enough contact with their families. Maybe 
they broke up. Uh, and some, indeed, the young, young ones, get in touch with other human beings they shouldn't be in touch with. Uh, so we saw if, if we then go to see how, <coughs> how, how many percent of the prisoners were spending under 30 days. So 43% of the prisoners in Norway at the, uh, in 2007, they spent under 30 days in prison. And then if, if, we, if you, as minister, look into that numbers, it must be magic what's happening in prison for 24 days, for example, if that is going to repair or is going to rehabilitate the one coming into prison. It, it's, it must really be magic if it's something is going to happen then. So one aspect for me was really to, I think we should be stronger against them and, and to say we maybe want to keep you longer in a system. We need to keep you because you need more time to be rehabilitated, really. Under 90 days, then 70% of the prisoner prison population were sitting under 90 days. And many of them were sitting on high security. So one of the measurements we, we did uh, implement was, was to establish low security prisons where people can go in and out on daytime, work for example, go schooling, uh, etc. These few days, maybe we should have a um, sanction against the youth, uh, which is longer, many more days, for two years, for example, but not sitting in prison. And we established that. So this, I, I mean, to do something with this is not to be soft on crime. If you want to be realistic and do something, you have to maybe be tougher regarding to how many days you are meeting this uh, criminals, but the, the place where they are coming are, are wrong, the prison. Maybe we could do something else, not what, what, what we did. <coughs> Another big problem we, we were facing very soon was that many, <coughs> many, pris, many people, they were waiting to uh, be put into prison. They were standing in a queue. So they didn't come into prison. They were waiting for years. That was not a good thing. So if you commit a crime, and there came no reaction to it, no, no sanction. So we wanted to speed up. And we said that a short or a, another reaction is much better than waiting for a prison years to come. So in 1960, we had 1,500 persons in prison. In 2007, 3,500. And among this, uh, uh, three and a half thousand people in, in prison. We know that two and a half thousand were waiting for uh, coming into prison. So in 2007, approximately for six thousand people were either waiting to come into prison or were in prison. You understand? Yeah. Today, and I, I want to show you that number because today. Uh, number of prisoners in Norway has increased a little bit, 3,700. And you can ask why when you have, if you f found some other uh, sanctions and some other measurements to meet this. Uh, but since 2007, it has been working very hard in Norway to reduce the queue and to take that amount and to finish all, all cases. One other main aspect in, in our work was to ask and to analyze and to start researching how, who are the prisoners? Who are they? And as a conclusion, and, and I think many of you know also this, it is pure living conditions, really. Uh, and many risk factors uh, and many risk factors for recidivism, really. 
it's not easy to change if you don't have a place to live, if you cannot read or write properly, or if you don't have a work to go back to. So when you come out of prison then, with a plastic bag, it's probably the norm, maybe you also have that phenomena, uh, it, it's not easy to, to start a new life and uh, now it's going to be better. For many of them, I'm sorry to say, it's worse when they're coming out. But you see the numbers uh, among the Norwegian prisoners, and we were really scared when we saw it. We, we, I, I didn't dream of that it was like this, so, so, so high numbers, 70% are unemployed. You would think they have got a job when they are coming out of prison. Is it easier to get a job when you have been in prison and come out? No. I think we, uh, we, need to, we have to ask that question. Because if, if you're a right-wing party member or you're a social democrat, socialist, you're a pirate or whatever you are, the main thing must be if you want to change, you have to have a basis for change. So um, we saw also 40% difficulties with reading and writing. And 30% have had a close family in prison. And 60% had drug problems, of course. And I, I met a system which not were reflecting that so many of the prisoners really had drug problems. Should we do something with it? Many of my voters and, uh, and, and Norwegian opinion, I think, I think it's important to do something with the drug problems. <coughs> what the drug problems is often the reason why they're committing crime. They want money for it. Or they don't have possibility to, to work properly because they have drug problems. So we have to do something with the drug, drug problems. Uh, the right-wing party in, in Norway and many <laughs> others, they, they thought this was to sort of a soft crime policy, which couldn't bear it. So I, I think it's, it's the opposite. So we had to expect also from the prisoners that they have to take, take the life into consideration. Ask them, what are you going to do? Do you want to take this opportunity to do something else than being in prison? We can offer you something, an alternative. But it depends on you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> this is statistics, and you have to be very careful with statistics. Uh, my daughter was writing about crime in school uh, last week, and she so, uh, sc should analyze um, statistics. And I, I learned her a lesson that you have to be very careful with it, of course. And this is a good example, of course, but you can see the orange line is um, investigated crime in Norway per 1,000 uh, inhabitants from uh, uh, 1990 and to 2006. So we can see that the police, they are doing more and more. And the blue line, it is uh, the number of prisoner per 100,000 people in, in, uh, in, in the country. So you can see that the number of prisoners have been stable for up to 2,000, but then it's increasing. It's a paradox because the number of investigated crimes has been declining. You can see that. But that is a result of a willingness in, in the political uh, debate and also in the parliament to use more of prison as a reaction from 1999. Well, a tough line, really. And we had a queue, and therefore it's increasing. We wanted to do something with that. We see that the number of investigated crimes is de declining since 1999 to 2005. And that was a good thing, really. Crime is going down. And we have... Uh, I think we have also other statistics uh, 
giving us proof on that. And we all, we, of course, we had to ask, what do the people think? When you are a politician, you need to think that. And if, if we ask them in, in surveys, they, they ask, they, they, they think we were too soft. So they want a tougher line. Tougher punishment. When they were asked, they want that. This is a um, survey from Denmark about how the general feeling of justice is for the Danish people. And the blue squares is all the people thinking that the punishment is too soft. But that's in what's interesting in this is that when the people are meeting up in the court, in, the Nor in Norway we have a system that they have, the politicians are on the list for being a, a part of the, the court. So you can sit with the, the judge beside him and yeah, find out is he guilty or not. Or, yeah, they are part of the system. Uh, when they are in court and when we ask them there, they think the sentence was too hard. They didn't believe it was so hard. They want community sentence. Many of them want community sentence. I think that's a very good thing. It's a good effect. Uh, that's, this is one reason why I don't think this topic is uh, useful for referendums. Then we have to bring all the people in the courts and uh, show them it's about meeting people, of course. You have to meet the boy sitting there. Listen to him. How is his family? How is his day in school? How has his life been, life been so far? And when you hear that, then you think suddenly that the punishment, hello, Elin, nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, it's a good colleague for me, for me in Nordic Council. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, but this is very important to take with us, and I think that this is very important to have such meeting like this, just to bring this forward and not leave this political issue to the, the newspapers and the television and the media, because there it is, black and white, really, black and white. This is not about black and white. It's very much grey color in it, but it's also very much happiness. Yeah. You know this police? <laughs> this is a very popular uh, media case in, in Norway about Iceland. It was in the biggest Norwegian newspaper last week. Uh, and it's, uh, it's police officers from Reykjavik. And they are uh, going to secure uh, security uh, in the most peaceful country in the world is the title. And come, come with the Icelandic police on job. And they were using social media. It was a person there in the, in the police force in Reykjavik, I think, named Ingvarsson. You know him? Nobody knows him. <laughs> I haven't been in touch with the police at all. But he's, he's, he said in Aftenposten then that... Uh, uh, the, the crime rate is falling in the whole western part of the world. But people are feeling that there's an increasing number of crimes happening. That's very much of the same. My old aunt, the police in Reykjavik, and if you ask the Danish people, they think it's more and more criminality. And he, he continued saying, even at uh, on Iceland, uh, people are thinking very often that they are living in a danger place. And one of the goals with uh, our work in the social media is to make a correction to this picture, said English. I think that's this is a very important debate to raise. How is people looking into this? We asked very early. Is it then like this, that if we have less imprisonment, we get less crime? <coughs> we 
if you see the average number of prisoners in 2007 in many countries. You can see your own country is Iceland. It's correct, you think? 37 in 2007? It's a very, very small number, of course. So it's interesting to see that these countries in the world having a very large number of prisoners per capita is the country in the, the, the countries in the world having most crime. And you can say, okay, <laughs> Uh, um, the number of prisoners is caused by that they have so much crime, of course. But there has, it has been like this for many, many years. And I have been visiting Rikers Island in New York. And it's triple times number of prisoners at that island than we fin that we can find in Norway. 10,000 in one island. And not very much rehabilitation. And it's private, commercial-driven uh, prisons in in United States, and that's also one of the reasons, after my opinion, that they have so many prisoners because it's an economic motive to to do it, really. Yeah. <clears throat> many good reasons to rethinking punishment. For Norway, it was about, of course, about the capacity. We didn't have capacity enough, and that gave us a very good opportunity to do something else. Let's do something different, in a different way. Uh, secondly, we need to do something uh, against recidivism. People are coming back and back. And if that was the situation in the schools or in the hospitals, that was not a good result. Then we have to, have to change. Um, obviously, the rehabilitation was not good enough, really. Absolutely not. And as I, I'm asking there, does it make you a better person to be locked up inside a small room without any social contact? No. You don't. And we, has, we have been very eager in Norway to, to emphasize that the reason why we are using prison is rational. We want uh, individual and general prevention, not revenge, for example. That's not one of the official reasons why we have prisons. I thought also that this was very important for us to raise a humanity aspect in this. People are living their lives in prison. Their days, their weeks, their months and their, some of their years, they are spending in prison. So we limited the sentence to take away the freedom from them. But when they are in prison, we wanted them to live as normal as possible. Caused by a humanity approach, but also we find more rehabilitation in it. I can see some of you are taking pictures of this. If you want a copy of it, you can get it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a very, very important aspect of our work was that we wanted also to be very clear on that we wanted to take care of the interests and the needs of the victims in this. Because many said to me in the political debate about this that this is I don't, want, uh, don't know how to translate it, really. I look at, at the ambassador now. Um, uh, the, it was a horn, what offer? Horn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this effort we were doing, it was not talking uh, for the victims. The victims, they wanted a strong punishment, you understand? And if it did some change in it, it was in a way, leaving the victim's platform and not seeing their interests. So we had to convince the, the, the parliamentarians, but also uh, the opinion, no, this is not to leave the victim's platform. This is 
if you really start speaking and, uh, uh, and discussing with a victim and ask her or him, what do you want with the reaction when you have caught the crime, criminal? What do you really want? And many of the victims told us, I don't want him to do it again. That's the main. Um, very, very few told me that I want to keep him in prison as long as possible. You have to ask, the, then you have to ask the next question. Why do you want to keep him there? Are you afraid? Or no, I don't want him to do it again. Against me or somebody else. That's the first one. But some of the victims also told us, I want to repair the damage. And do prisoners repair the damage? No, mostly not. The Norwegian system isn't established like that. If, for example, somebody steals my car in Norway, do the prisoner bring it back to me? Or pay, pay a new car if he has destroyed it? No, he didn't. It was the insurance company, maybe, did it. But if I don't have insurance on the car, nobody did it. So we wanted to establish a reaction a sanction who did uh, bring reconciliation and restoring aspect into it. You have, and then we were not soft against the prisoner. You have to pay back. That's important. You have, if you have been tagging down a wall, you have to repair it. Use some, use some of your life, some of your days in life to repair it. Use some hours to meet, to meet the victim. Even in serious cases. And that's the reason why we suggested for the parliament that we should have uh, a uh, use sentence, but also a possibility in serious cases to use mediation board. And then people really was looking to me. I, he's going mad. In, in murder, in rape cases, we are going to use mediation board. Yes. In many cases it's possible. In addition to prison, of course. It's very important for many victims to listen to, to the, the criminal and to hear it was, it's my responsibility not your responsibility. I saw this is wrong, don't know me, I don't want to do it again. It's my responsibility, I pay you back. Pay you back economically or in other ways. As far as I can, of course. In some cases, it was not possible to do that. If you lost your father and he's killed, it's not so easy to meet the murderer. But it happened in Norway. We had a young police officer, I've been writing about him in my book, and he told me that uh, he lost his father. He was shot down in the Nukas robbery in Stavanger. And he said, I, 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 have give, I have forgiven the murderer, given him, and I want to meet him. And this young man, he is today working as a police officer. And, and he told me that and in a very good way, and I've also been in television to say, the most important thing of the process when I lost my dear father was to meet the murderer, to forgive him, and to go on in my life. That's a very seldom aspect we have in political debate about it, to be longest as possible in prison. The victims need very often something else to, to go with. Many of the victims of the Utøya and what's happened in, in 2011 in Oslo, they have also very much of the same thought. They want, don't want to make a life with hate. They want to go on. The hate is a very heavy burden to bear for them, to bear for them. So they want to go on. They don't want to forgive the criminal standing back. Uh, Utøya, uh, of course, it's so out of every aspect, uh, but it's a dimension in it I think we should deal a little bit with. And that's the longest sentence is not e uh, always the answer for what victims are want wanting. And therefore we, we build it up in 
in connection with uh, uh, a new policy on this area, a wide range of measurement for the victims. That was very, very important for us to bring in. And some of the resources we <coughs> could use on prison, it's very expensive to put people in prison. If you use uh, sanction, it's economically cheaper. We wanted to move these resources to build, uh, for example, uh, uh, children houses for uh, the children uh, being uh, sexual abu abused, uh, 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 compensation uh, economically for paid by the government for the victims, and so on and so on. And then we, in the rethinking, we also wanted to mark very clearly that this was some types of crime we thought we need to increase the penalties. And that was for homicide, rape, serious violence, and child abuse, and the domestic violence. We needed to do that. Is time going out? Yeah. Ten minutes. Okay, then I have to go on. <laughs> okay. Um, some principles in, in what we were doing. More rehabilitation. I'm going to do it fast now. Uh, this principle of normality, as I told you about, it should be when you are in prison, the life should be as normal as possible. That was the reason why we are building libraries in every prison in Norway. People, people thought we were crazy when we were doing it. Libraries? Yes. Libraries is a very good place to come for everybody. You, me, prisoners, it's a normal zone in the prison. You can meet people working in the library that treat you like a human being, not a prisoner. Um, we uh, thought it was very important to, of course, take care of the public security. And we meant if we rehabilitate, it was more public security. Um, punishment should be based on prevention, individually and generally, not revenge. Uh, and when people had uh, served uh, their sentence, they had paid their debt to the society. Few words about how we did it. We had a very unusual process uh, about this. It was a white paper pres presented in, the, in the parliament in 2007 or eight. Uh, the whole cabinet was involved in this. That was very important for me. This is what um, the historical mi uh, misunderstanding was that this was just a political issue for the Minister of Justice. And a part of the wrongdoing was laying there because we needed help from the health ministry. We needed assistance from the, the labor and social ministry. We needed help from the cultural ministry. We wanted cultural activities in the prisons, established theater, music groups, and so on. Uh, we needed help from uh, almost every ministry in, in, in the cabinet, and we did, we did make a, a common presentation of this. We had um, groups of discussion before we pre made, made the pres presentations with uh, students, organizations for prisoners, former justice ministers, think tank with professionals, employees, political parties, the opposition were invited to, to deal with this because I thought it was so important to raise this issue in every po political party, not only the government's party. The NGOs played a very important role for us, the prisoner, youth, families, or, or so on. We had an own website, the website and a grand conference about it, like this, a little bit bigger. And I was visiting every prison in Norway, many of them twice. So there is not so many people in Norway who has been visiting so many prisoners, prisons as I have then. I have been walking in and out of prison all my life, I say, <laughs> to my uh, old aunt. <laughs> Try to initiate debate. And we had also ma made some personal interviews in the white paper. Um, some, of, uh, some of what we did, village prison, very exciting project. We have two of them in Norway, Bygde, uh, Bastøy, and 
Hassel fengsel. The prisoners are living on a farm. They really have to stay up in the morning to take care of the coal and milk the coal. Yeah. Uh, we built Halden, Halden prison. Very expensive. 1,3 million Norwegian krona uh, in Icelandic. It's uh, 100,000 million uh, kronor. <laughs> <laughs> But that is very expensive. It was very expensive and it was highly debated in Norway. We wanted to do it very special. Uh, it's a big, uh, huge prison and very modern with family facilities. Very important. Where the chi child or the children could come and meet their father or their mother. Uh, they can stay over for weekend. Because one of the main aspects in rehabilitation is to keep in contact with your family network. And I made a, a book, uh, it was a Christmas present for me uh, before leaving <laughs> the ministry. And I made, made a book, uh, a cooking book. Uh, honest food from Halden Fengsel, Halden Prison. Very good food, I've not been poisoned yet. <laughs> um, short about the measures. Alternative uh, to, uh, to prisons. Electronic tagging, for example, were in, introduced. This reconciliation board. Youth sentence, reconciliation board was a very important part of the youth sentence. The, the youth were not put into prison anymore. And today it's very few persons below 18 years sitting in prison in Norway. They don't have anything to do there. Absolutely not at all. We have to take care of the society if they are dangerous, of course. But then it's special in institutions. Just a few. Just a few. Very important. We have built a lot of new prisons with low security, so they can go to school, go to work, and just a part of the sentencing be in prison. They are released, uh, like building a staircase, so they can go out and, and continuing, for example, with electronic tagging. We were building capacity inside the prison, so they can meet the same system they were meeting outside the prison. Some of them were not meeting anything outside the prison either. But the healthcare system uh, made up um, drug uh, addicted uh, uh, or apartment, uh, departments for uh, drug addicted inside the prison so they could be rehabilitated successfully, really. Cultural activities, so on and so on. I mentioned the support to the victims. Uh, no children in prison, I mentioned. It, in 2007, we had 41 children in prison, also below 18 years old. Uh, I think if you go, uh, that was for a year, but if you s asked for one day in Norway in 2007, it was between five and ten uh, young people sitting in, in prison. I said, this rich country must afford to find something else for these five young people, not having them in old style prisons. Uh, I, I so talked about this social network, very important, and of course the tougher sentence for domestic violence. I could have a own speech about that. I think that's very important to do something with. Uh, and then we introduced what we called a return to society guarantee. That all prisoners should have a guarantee from the officials and the government uh, that they will meet uh, people from the healthcare, education, work, place to live, and so on. They should have a place to live when they were coming out. So we had some project inside the prison where even the prisoners were building their own homes inside the prison. Not inside the prison they were building, but they were starting uh, the, the work. Um, we had to start it in, in, in prison. Yeah. Then I'm finishing. Um, uh, I, I, want to, I want to welcome to Norway, and you have to learn Norwegian, and that's why you can buy this book outside here, uh, and it's going to victims, the money, but if you don't buy it, please steal it. Uh, it's a book about when I have written about 10 persons I have met as ministers and their lives, not only prisoners, but also victims. Very exciting. For example, this boy losing his father uh, in Stavanger in this uh, Nukas robbery. I think you should take a lesson. And I want to show you, just, can I do it?
it's a f just a few minutes. If if I can manage this, uh, I think it will be fantastic. Um, Michael Moore, you know him. He has been on Iceland and made a film, and and he made a film about Norway too. But it was a small part of of, of this film made by Michael Moore. He couldn't show in the United States. It was so unbelievable. And that was a clip from Basto Fengsel, a village prison on an island, island in, uh, in the fjord of Oslo. Maybe I succeed in doing this, or I need some rehabilitation. Look at this phrase. All of Norway seems to be beautiful, peaceful, mm. and civilized. But one place within Norway out a place reachable only by boat. An island that's a model of sustainable ecology. A destination for families on the weekend. A popular spot for locals to experience a close-knit community of murderers, rapists, and child molesters. Okay, this, uh, this is uh, Håvald and um, Ronny. Uh, the two, two guys is living here. Um, they will talk with you, um, tell you about uh, how it is to, to stay here. Meet Horvald Shervin, an official for UNICEF, who had a better idea of where the children's money should be spent. And Ronnie Meerstadt, his looks could kill, but his hands did instead. And those guys can walk around with you afterwards. Okay. Maybe we can have a cup of coffee or something. Perfect. Every activity we have on the island should be uh, an activity that will bring you to, uh, to learn responsibility. Uh, if I pick up the potatoes every autumn, and we, we try to get every prisoners and every staff member to do it together. If we do that together, we are uh, doing something that shows the prisoners that we are equal human beings. Every guy you will see out here are, are prisoners. Uh, those who are working here will, will wear a uniform. They live four, five, six people together. Um, they have to, uh, to wake themselves up in the morning, make their own breakfast and go to work just like you and me. Tyve? No. It tells me it's 20 degrees in the water, I think it's 15. They told you, you know they're prisoners. I'm working outside with ordinary people. I go down and take the ferry out of the island and go to the shore and travel to work. I'm only here on the weekends and, uh, and the nights, so that's good. I tried to get a job on this ferry right away. We got a good opportunity to smuggle and uh, run away and so... <laughs> Did you ever think about doing that? No. I feel I have managed to calm down because I used to work 20 hours a day. I used to travel 300 days a year. Um, I'm sure I'll live 10 years longer because I'm here. Yeah, it looks like paradise, but when you're staying here, it's, everything sounds so easy and you can go out and you can do this and do this, but <clears throat> you always know that it's a prison. We had a prisoner here. He was uh, convicted for murder. He uh, cut two people up with a uh, chainsaw. And, uh, uh, most people will think uh, that uh, this kind of person cannot be in this kind of prison. He have to be locked up. But he came to this prison on the last uh, time of his sentence, and he served here for four years, and he worked in the forest with a chainsaw. We have dinner parties. I have had a tie and a jacket on a couple of times, but that's on special occasion. Maybe the way to rehabilitate prisoners is to send them to dinner parties or have them work on their tan. If you treat people properly, 
uh, they may change behavior and be good, ordinary citizens. Yes, these people are crazy. Hello. So thank you for an informative and and very inspiring lecture. As you can see, there is a great interest for your message here in Iceland. And I I would say that attitudes are actually changing quite a lot in Iceland, but they have to but and the aim of the pirates and the social democrats is that in five years' time, we will have an Icelandic Minister of Justice telling the same success story for Iceland. But before that, we will have to do a little bit more changing of attitudes and, of course, change of laws. But now we have the opportunity to ask Knut a few questions before we get the panel here. So go ahead and shoot. About Nepal gets this privilege being a politician. So I'm so sorry, you were the second one. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Knut, for a very, very good uh, speech. And I'm very inspired to see all the, all the crowd here today. Uh, uh, you, may, you talked very much about you know, changing attitudes. And maybe it's not too far-fetched. I mean, we have experience here in Iceland of uh, that we used to send um, teenagers with behavioral problems away from the families somewhere out on the countryside where they were then subject to all sorts of abuse and institutional bullying and God knows what. And then they came back home to their families and of course, you know, the same problems were there as were there when they went. So uh, this never served any, any constructive purpose because uh, there were the, the all, all the behavior behavioral problems stemmed, of course, from something that was uh, built on some other root cause, whether it was learning difficulties or abuse at home or, or God knows what. So, uh, but when you talked about it uh, earlier there, uh, early in your expose, about the 75% spending such a short time in prison, uh, then, of course, that begs the question, and you mentioned, I mean, maybe a better solution could be a different sort of sentencing that could maybe be longer, that could maybe be more community-based. And um, uh, Could you maybe expand a little bit on that? I mean, what sort of ideas could we work with? I think we all agree that the most stupid thing we can do with, with, with young people that are committing their first offense would be to sort of put them in a prison where they get to know you know, the trait properly. You should rather try to help them uh, out of the cycle that they are, they are about to enter. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Knut will answer this question. I should have, right in the beginning, have told you to ask very short questions. <laughs> <laughs> but we will have short questions and as short answer as possible, so that we have more people can ask you, and then we will have time for the panel. But short answer, Arne, because uh, uh, I, I thought uh, indeed uh, how to meet the youth and the juveniles. We needed to secure that uh, sanction were uh, widened out in time towards them. But we couldn't have youth in, in prison. I, I, I thought my political view was that, that it shouldn't be in prison at all. We need to find a new sanction. And we did it, the youth sentencing. And it, that is a mix of mediation, conciliation board, uh, mixed up with um, 
surveillance uh, we, from um, the child welfare system and the school and so on. And that lasts for approximately two years. So they have to meet in this mediation board, meet the victims of their crimes. That's very tough for young people. And the parents are coming with them, the neighbors maybe, or the school, the teacher. So it's a very tough meeting for them. And they write a contract, how to live on, how to go on their lives for two years. That's much more than 30 days in prison. And they have, the society have to follow them up, of course. And if they drop out from this agreement, they have to come in court again. So that's a much, many of them are asked after going through this, uh, what do you think? And they are answering, uh, if I do something wrong once more, I think I would prefer prison for some day. <laughs> yeah, they told us. So uh, this myth about uh, this is not being tough on crime, uh, I totally disagree because, I mean, this was really tough and it's really tough. But we avoid putting this child in, in prisons because they are a child, but they are put in a very strict system. Uh, and uh, I think many of them have showed us that they can uh, turn on in their lives. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Olaver Sigurdsson. Uh, I'd like to ask you, because we have uh, the bank robbers now in minimum security, uh, they, through their work, uh, robbed a lot of money from us and hurt us very badly. And now they are in minimum security with their computers keeping on their work. So I would uh, like your opinion if this would, uh, is this the way to rehabilitate them? To keep them in min minimum security with everything as it was before and having their friends and, and uh, people from the financial sector visiting them, etc. So I would just like your opinion on this method or if there is a better way to rehabilitate them because they have uh, large companies and a lot of power and they will come back into society and probably keep on, keep it up. You know. Thank you. It's, it's strange about econo economical crimes because very seldom in Norway we bring serious offenders to court who has committed uh, serious economical crime. So one very important aspect of that in Norway indeed is to, is to investigate more in such cases. But uh, we were building a system and trying to build a system, and it, it takes uh, many years. We are not finishing, finishing Norway at all. The number of prisoners shows us that we have big challenges still. But we wanted to make a system which is flexible. A, a bank robbery, a real bank robber, that's a combination crime. Violence and, uh, and, uh, and uh, theft. And this combination can be very dangerous, and some of them we need to keep in prison, of course. Uh, but I think it's very important not to exclude the rich ones in a society from being put in prison. I think some of them, and there, if there is some group of people where you can see there are real prevention in being in prison is towards these groups. So we need a flexible system. But after some Time, I think also these groups has to take part of what we call rehabilitation. So, but this is why we have uh, courts. They are going to take decision in the individual cases, not the politicians. And my project was to make it so flexible that you have the possibility to make one reaction for a juvenile and one reaction for a rich bank robber and another reaction for a, a, a bank robber dealing with great uh, drugs problems, for example. Yeah. Hello, my name is Oscar, and uh, I was going to ask a question, but first I'd like to address the person before, because as you mentioned, these bank robbers are in minimum security, and I would like to 
point out that these prisoners are working self-willingly to rehabilitate their other inmates. Uh, and so, of course, they are supposed to be kept in minimum security if they are uh, going to be able to help other prisoners who cannot uh, do basic math or cannot read, then of course they are helping in their situation and that is good. But my first, uh, my question is, uh, what are your opinions on criminal records uh, with regards to employment afterwards, after you have finished your sentencing, if you are, if you have paid, truly paid your debt to society and your sentence is supposed to be your repayment, then uh, how do you feel about uh, conditioning employment with criminal records with regards to soft crime, like drug-related crimes? Uh, is it fair that uh, you, cannot, you can uh, deny someone employment if he has a drug-related offense, which is a health care problem, not a criminal problem? It's, it's very easy for me to say, I don't think it's fair that these people are not getting any jobs. I think we should work hard to, to manage to give them jobs, really. Then they have to do something with the criminal record, but um, I think the main thing we did was to start the work with uh, getting a new job when they were in prison. That's the reason why we build schools in every prison, not only libraries, but also schools, prison schools. And we had some very, very good experience about doing this. Because they got uh, skills in, in the prison, being a carpenter, or a, uh, to cook food, or uh, and anything. Lawyers, not lawyers, but uh, they could study law. Uh, and then it was easier for, for them in cooperation with the correctional service to get in contact with uh, with um, firm, firmas, companies where they could have jobs. And um, we had some big companies in Norway uh, going into agreement with us in the, in the ministry to take, for example, 20 prisoners in their company. And they told us back it was Stormberg made in, making clothes. And they told back that this was the most loyal workers they had. So when they were going to a cruise to Denmark, celebrating the Christmas, they had to leave one or two employees to take care of the shop. And that was the two some, uh, who were coming from the prison. Because they hadn't, uh, they hadn't permission to leave the country. And uh, they did their job very well. But this is very difficult, of course. And it's about how we are speaking about this issue out in opinion. And that, therefore, I think it's so important to do it. it many, many of these prisoners are doing a very good job when they're coming out. They're very loyal. But some are not doing. So I have now seven more questions. So if there is anyone else that wants to ask a question, give me sign very quickly. And I now tell you again, please, short questions and ask short answers as possible. But I'm not leaving Reis a week before Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for a very interesting and uh, informing uh, talk. Uh, you touched uh, very briefly on, on uh, the importance of uh, NGOs. And uh, you uh, started very effectively uh, uh, work with uh, uh, the Red Cross Network at the uh, um, the Salvation Army, and uh, so on. Uh, why is it important to include uh, NGOs into this process? Very good question. I, I know you know Red Cross and the network uh, work they are doing. Uh, and the Salvation Army, for example, were, were very important and are very important in our process. I think that's a key, how to make normality for these people when they're leaving prison. That they're getting in touch with NGOs before they're leaving prison. For what, what is an NGOs? That's ordinary people. That's me and you. And therefore, we have great pleasure of inviting uh, visitors from the Red Cross coming into the prison. We have this network after sentencing. 
so they have something to, to continue the work, the divided section in the Red Cross, but extremely important. And therefore, I, I work pretty hard in, in the ministry to, to tell our officials that this is not a work only for the officials. We need the whole society going with us on this. And it's for in every other sectors, healthcare, education, and so on, the NGOs are playing a very important role in Norway. And they should do it here too. These people are really asking to, to get the new social network. And if not Red Cross or the Salvation Army or the youth organization are coming with us on that work, I think we made a failure. So uh, they, therefore they have a very central play, a role in, in this work. We have a lot of science on this, but it's very difficult. Every prisoner is an individual. So we can divide it into what sort of crimes he has committed, as you are doing now. But it's very difficult, and it's very difficult to compare. And very much of the science, I don't think it's comparable. So, uh, but, so we have to do more about it. But I, I, I mean that we have very good scientific arguments for, for example, that community sentence of, uh, uh, and uh, indeed uh, young people serving community sentence, that there's not so much recidivism uh, than if you are putting them into prison, for example. Uh, I also think that it, it is some uh, science about how to meet more ordinary people suddenly committed some crime. Uh, not, not a recidivist, but uh, for example, uh, uh, financial fraud. Uh, and, uh, it's extremely hard for many of them to be put in prison, of course. Uh, and I think for the general uh, prevention, that is a very important aspect. And it doesn't matter how long the sentence is, but just that situation to come into prison is a hard one. But this is difficult, but I think we should, of course, be aware of it. And my conclusion in, when I was reading such science, and we, we brought the scientists with us in this work, was that we have to be flexible. We have to have a flexible system, not only towards what sort of crime you have been doing, but what sort of individuals, individuals you were, and what sort of situation you had in your life. And that's what the main aspect when you are meeting in court. You are treated as individual not a political party or an interest group or something, you are an individual. And that's a very good reason to also tell the politician that stay off when, uh, when the court are trying to find a reaction or sanction. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Christine. Thank you for the uh, lecture. Um, I was, uh, I'm curious about the gender aspect of, uh, of uh, your prison system. How many women are there? Uh, what's the rate of men and women in the prison system and um, with the crimes? What, what's the difference be, between their crimes? And if you also have a special uh, women's prisons. And I'm also curious about, uh, you talked about substance abuse treatment in the prison. What, uh, what, what kind of treatment do you offer? Thank you. Yeah. To, to the last one, we, we established drug centers inside the prisons. 
where the, where the prisoners could, be, could have a rehabilitation. And that was an individual uh, uh, aspect of that. You, some, somebody uh, had to be moved out of the prison to a rehabilitation uh, arrangement. Uh, but uh, we had some doctors, some psychologists running this uh, drug treatment center in the prison. So they should meet them immediately when they're coming into prison, not when they were coming out. And when the people were coming out from prison, they didn't meet anybody. So it was a start of treatment. And that was long term work. About gender, uh, uh, I must say that if. Uh, uh, we only had had uh, women in Norway, and no, no men. Uh, very good at uh, not the situation, but then we had to have almost no crime in Norway. Very low cr uh, crime rate among women in Norway, but for young, uh, young women, uh, we have seen a little increase of crime uh, in the last 10 years, and we have um, we established then uh, our own low security prison for women because they didn't have it. We had only one prison that was high security in Oslo uh, and it was very unfair uh, towards the women, of course. They couldn't uh, serve their sentence in low security or um, take pa part of many of the good arrangements for, uh, for prisoners. So that was a very important part of this work, to uh, make uh, fairness about how, how we met the women coming into prison. And also the family aspect was, of course, very important for them. Many of the women coming into prison were having babies, uh, ch children, and so on. And we wanted them to uh, be in the possibility to take care of them. Uh, and they could, for example, build a family house in the women prison where the they could uh, meet their children, for example, in the weekends and so on. So that's some aspect of it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Knut, for a very inspirational lecture. Um, one of the things I'm guessing many people are thinking is the budget issue. And, um, well, of course, this can be expensive, uh, although humanity does not necessarily cost. Uh, one of the, and I, I saw that uh, in your lecture, that there are many things you can do uh, that doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money. Uh, one of the things that they are introducing in the new bill here in Iceland is uh, family leaves for prisoners, and we also have currently uh, the possibility for prisoners to work outside the prison and uh, go to school outside the prisons. But for most of those options, you have to first be in prison for many years before you have the possibility to, um, to have this kind of family leaves and, and these opportunities. I want to as ask you to, um, comment on that and how you, you go about it in Norway and also if you can just very quickly tell us um, how much does this cost if you maybe take the, the building of the Halden prison aside was this a great increase in, in cost to do this transformation? It's a good question. Uh, I, I didn't mention the finance minister when I, I told who were involved in this project, and, uh, but he was involved, and she, it was Kristin Halvorsen, uh, for some years, being with us. But I told her very early in this work that you can, you can spend the money on building very expensive prisons, like we have been doing, Halden, or you can use money on alternative sanctions. Some of them are also expensive. If you, if you want to fill it with the rehabilitation work, you, it costs. But I told her very early, this is, this is investment for the future. And that's the point of uh, where the finance ministers don't uh, go along uh, anymore with you, because uh, they don't uh, have in their budget what we, what we get back in 10 years. That's difficult. Um, electronic tagging, for example, 
introduced in Norway, where people can serve the sentence home. Uh, almost as expensive as putting a, a, a prisoner or a criminal in prison. But because uh, we wanted to, it should be quality. So she, she or he should meet people from the welfare sector and school and giving uh, opportunity to start work and so on. And that's, that, that's also a price for it. But I think we, we did some political choice. And we, we did do some investment in this area instead of giving all the, the money in the justice sector to the police. And I tried my best to tell the police, if you go along with us on this road, you will have less work to do for the future. And that's the challenge. It's difficult. We have four more questions and one more minute. So, do you want? Yeah, good day. You had Gilvi Thorkelson, who is a chancellor story in Fangelson, and Little Rune and Sogni. I wanted to ask you how, how you do you organize uh, education for prisoners? Do they, you, you emphasize uh, open prison and uh, do prisoners uh, attend public schools? Uh, how does society uh, react to that? Do we have special uh, schools in prisons? What kind of education do you offer to prisoners and uh, how big a part is education uh, in your mind to uh, in uh, rehabilitation? Yeah. We I told, told you that we established schools in every prison. And we did that. Uh, that was one of the goals to do. And it was the Minister for um, Education who paid it. His, the, his ministry then. He was paying it. Uh, that illustrates very good that this is a challenge for everybody. And then we established, for example, public college in prison. So in... Um, in Oslo, for example, it's a high school or a college, uh, ordinary college, and we told them one part of your work is to establish education inside the prison. And we told another college in my hometown, Elvrum, eastern part of Norway, your um, obligation to this is to establish uh, education inside Elvrum prison, or Hama prison. So every prison got their school. So uh, the prisoners today have opportunity to fulfill uh, their uh, education. And for those who were finishing college, um, we, had a, we have established a system for them to go on in un university. They can do it from the prison, or they can ask the prison to be, be released in daytime to follow up the lectures and so on. Uh, and many, many of the prisoners have really done great work in school. And uh, they have, um, uh, I, I think that that's the main reason that many prisoners also get job when they are coming out. To show uh, a company that uh, while I was in prison I managed to take a law degree. Do you have any use for me? And I think the company should ask, uh, should answer yes. You, you have talent, really, yeah. Yes, my name is uh, Geir Gunnarsson, and uh, sadly, Newt, I uh, have you beat on the time spent in prison. I was just, uh, I was just released after uh, 17 and a half years in the United States, hmm. and uh, I have a lot of questions for you, but unfortunately, I only have time for one. Take it tomorrow. And uh, the topic <laughs> would be uh, mental health issues. What? I, the mental health issue. Yeah. Unfortunately, where I was at, the largest prison on the East Coast, over 3,000 inmates. I saw a number of prisoners in there that did not need to be in prison, but needed more mental health assistance. And my question to you is, uh, how and what would you do regarding mental health in the prison system in Iceland, since I hear there is only one or two psychologists available for the entire prison system in Iceland, and there is not enough rehabilitation available for them in the system, or after, this, after they get out of the system? This is, this is still a big challenge in Norway too. 
so we, are, we just have to work on to, to build out uh, the prisons and, uh, and, and uh, giving prisoner, more prisoners more psychiatric and psychologist help from and assistance. Uh, and we are not finished in, in Norway either. Uh, and many, many are asking me, uh, is it fair that prisoners get this help, but my daughter don't get it outside? It's lack of uh, such health care for everybody. So this is a very important political issue still in Norway. So we are arguing, uh, arguing that uh, before any reducing of taxes in Norway, we need to build out this. We need to do this first. That's my simple answer. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your interesting lecture. My name is Erland Baltuson. I have been working in corrections for a long time, but I've, uh, I'm retired now. Uh, I have a practical question for you. I'm not very good at asking short questions, but I, I will try to do it now. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, you have had the problem with a queue, waiting list. Uh, we have even much bigger problem here in Iceland than have had for many years. Uh, could you give our politicians here, members of parliament, uh, some good ideas? I'm very pleased to see so many of you here. But could you give them some good ideas how you managed to reduce your waiting list from 2,500 or something like that until zero? Thank you. Um, we, we did a lot of things to reduce the queue uh, and, uh, and the political environment and the parliament was very happy that we, we managed to do it but now it's increasing again so that's the new government <laughs> uh, but um, we were building a lot of new places and new prisons in Norway but they were low security so it was old fashioned uh, buildings owned by the, the government, used for uh, other purposes. Uh, we used them, rebuilt them, and established uh, many hundred places. Very cheap, uh, not high security. And for those who had just 30 days in prison, they could come there. And they, they are still in functioning. But also the alternatives for example, electronic tagging at home was very important to reduce the queue. They could stay at home instead of being in prison. Uh, also extending the community sentence, very important in this. We tried to avoid to reduce the sentence as itself. That has also been one, one measure in, in this work, to reduce it. They should be only in prison for half time, for example. We tried to re re reduce uh, such uh, measures because I meant it was very important that they serve their sentence, but in another way. And to get, I, will list, I want to also stress you ask about psychologists and so on. I felt very often when, when the prisoners were in prison and that it was argument, argued with uh, that they, they needed a, a psychiatrist or some, something else, many of them uh, was not really in need of that. They were in need of normality. And they, when they met a carpenter, or they had, was going into a part of a project uh, c taking care of dogs in prison. We did, uh, one prison has uh, a dog project, uh, taking care of the dogs for the army, in, re in fact. It's a fantastic project. They get the responsibility for a little animal. This is your responsibility. You have to build a house for him, for the dog, uh, give him, to feed him, and to train him. And they were really growing, both the dog and the prisoner. So such thinking, I think it was another way to see the problems and to give them a, a solution. Um, uh, many of the prisoners were having very good experience of uh, been doing cultural activities, standing, uh, playing theater for an audience and uh, getting applause, writing a book, and so on. So, Maybe also that's a part of the answer to you, guys. Because I, I don't, I, uh, I think we need to also 
give them an opportunity to show sides of themselves that we don't see normally in prison. Okay, now we have time for the last question. Then Knut has to go to a, to a TV interview. So it's the last one from Helgi. Thank you for your leadership, Knut. Uh, uh, as I've told you earlier, uh, I presented a bill in the parliament currently being debated where I propose that our judges get the possibility to sentence primarily young people to social services rather than imprisonment. Uh, and I think it might be useful if you could explain why you in Norway leave that decision up to the judge rather than leaving it up to the prison system uh, and the influence that has uh, amongst other things on, on the criminal record that was mentioned here earlier. Thank you. We, we, we did turn around a little bit about community sentence. So uh, it was uh, in old days in Norway you had a possibility to have a community work but you have uh, in the bottom of it uh, uh, go into the court and, and got sentencing in prison as a result. But the correctional service could do, do it over again and made it, make it to a community sentence. I don't thought that was fair in uh, about legal security re reasons. Because I, I, I thought it was very important that the judge meeting the individuals also took the decision about such an important question. Should we really take the risk to put this 17-year-old boy into prison for the first time? That's a risk to do it. Uh, if my 16-year-old daughter do something wrong, I will ask every types of gods in the world not to put her in the women prison in Oslo. Uh, that's a very, very important issue, and I think it's so important that the judge has to decide it. That was the reason why we established community service as a new form of sentencing in Norway, and called it community sentence. That's the reason. So, but um, today um, uh, the community, the correction service has the possibility to do it uh, over again if uh, the um, the convicted person not meet for a community sentence. Then they can do it over again uh, and uh, bring a new case for the court. And they make a new decision. Maybe you should try once more to give a community sentence or you should try to, uh, or you need to uh, react stronger against the UNI, for example. And we also made a possibility to have a mix, a combination, you had some days in prison, but the rest of it, community sentence. Okay. Tusen tack, Knut. It has been... But, but a few last words. Thank you so much for coming here, using last day in the week for this. I think it's very important. For big countries and small countries, it's very important. So I, if you need me or you need any more information about what we have been doing, please take contact. I will use any opportunity to come back to this lovely island as often as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Knut. <laughs>